Buongiorno! This week I baked a double layer cheesecake with hazelnut and salted caramel topping for Guido's birthday. Gianfranco has been sick and teething so I have basically been awake and soothing him non-stop all night every night. The tradesman came and there has been some progress on our bedroom, but there was a little problem with the bathroom floor. Do you remember months ago I put on a special treatment wax to protect the handmade terracotta? Well, I had sent the product to the builders who laid the floor first to check that it was okay to use, and the main guy said yes. Then his father, who is a lot more knowledgeable, was here giving us a quote, and he saw it and said, ah, oh, no, this is the wrong product to use. My heart just sank when he said that because it was so much time and money I put on multiple layers and I, and I specifically sent a picture of the product to them and said, is this the right one to use? And they said, yes. So I just rang the company. They said to put on this sort of degreaser thing to strip it right back and then mop it four times, which I did at, a, at like midnight while Gianfranco was sleeping. The elderly tradesman, he suggested heating it with a blow dryer and uh, this makes the, it sort of melts the wax deeper into the tile and that seems to be working and giving quite a nice color which both Guido and I like and, uh, and so it's a painstakingly slow process. And finally I got, instead of the hairdryer, I got a professional torch which is making things a bit, a bit better. My experience with terracotta in Italy is that every time you ask someone they have a different opinion on the correct method for looking after terracotta. Even when I did the sitting room, you know, I did that with linseed oil and tractor oil and, uh, and the people I asked for that process, they have now changed their opinion and they're giving me different advice uh, for the bathroom terracotta. So I think through trial and error I shall just have to find my own method and uh, I've certainly learnt the hard way but um, now finally the colour is what it should be and they're coming up really well. But you see the test is, is that when you put the water on it, uh, it should just remain like that and not seep into the tile and that's what the wax or oil or um, that's the, the purpose it serves is so that the pores are filled up by a material so that when you've got water or any kind of uh, liquid on top of the, the floor it's not being absorbed by the, the tiles it's just staying on the on the surface there so actually it's not such a big mistake because the, it means that the pores have been filled and the now the, the the tiles have been protected from their pores being clogged with something else but it's just uh, about the the the, the color you see it was just sort of quite quite chalky and, and, and not rich. But even when you put, it uh, doesn't look so good now, but that's just because it's not the right light. Um, but even uh, when you put the water on top of this, now that I've blow dried it, um, you see the water still remains, which means that even with melting off that top layer, uh, it's still, they're still ostensibly sealed. Uh, Sorry, this is a bit too much information on terracotta. You probably don't care, but um, I find it interesting because I didn't know so much about terracotta until I moved into this um, house or actually even in fact in the old place that we used to live at as well. When Guido's mother taught me a lot about it because I was just, you know, you, you, if you're used to just normal tiles, you just assume, well, that you can even use any cleaning products on them, but I mean, everything, that you use on terracotta, you just have to be mindful of the fact that it is a, uh, a different material. And perhaps now it doesn't look very nice, but when I sent the photos to Guido, Guido's actually in Venice at the moment on a bit of a boy's trip. Uh, before that he was working in Florence, so he decided to continue and go up to Venice. Uh, but anyway, I sent him the photos of of this and he said oh I love this colour, um, he loves it a lot more, this rich colour and he loves the fact that it's sort of uneven because uh, if you have every tile looking the same uh, he feels and I agree with him that it kind of it has no character and it kind of just looks industrial whereas um, in this way uh, it can uh, feel a lot more rustic and, and and, and really make the tiles look like they've, they've been here for a hundred years. <laughs> Hi. 
potato ready to drop I got a hot potato Somebody stop me It's a molto caldo Fuori dal forno It's a hot potato Straight out of the pot How can I handle you, baby? Nobody even holds a candle, my baby You and me are gonna be a scandal But baby, you're a hot potato No ifs, ands, or maybes, baby Hot potato, spicy as sin I got a hot potato Potato giving me spins. I need a aqua jacata. Cause baby, it's a lot, a lot of hot potato trouble I'm in. How can I handle you, baby? Nobody even holds a candle, but baby. You and me are gonna be a scandal, but baby, how can you blame me? I love hot potatoes. last episode I began sanding and chipping away at the ceiling and walls of our future bedroom which will be attached to the ensuite bathroom. The night before the tradesman came my parents and Gianfranco helped me move all the remaining rubbish and furniture and debris although we were still in disbelief that they would actually show up the next day. Buongiorno. Ah, I'm so excited. Two really positive things. The builders are coming this morning. I hope, I think, every time the builders actually come, I get so excited like it's Christmas, just oh, finally progress, progress. And the second really big thing is that Gianfranco slept until 5 a.m. this morning. And I feel like a different person. I feel so rested. It's amazing uh, that 5 a.m., it just feels like such a late start. I feel, and then I, I take him <clears throat> into bed with me and uh, and breastfeed for two hours and he sort of snoozes and he's just kind of like uh just you know wants the comfort i think and and uh but uh it's yeah it's such a game changer ah oh, 5 a.m amazing amazing <laughs> i know a lot of you were saying kylie why don't you do the plastering obviously i'm a very hands-on diy type of person and uh, also my family are uh but in this case there's just, there are structural complications that you have to take into account. And with this house, it's certainly, um, there. we've just found with certain ceilings, uh, it, you really, instead of just doing a, a slap job and, and kind of, you can do the plastering, obviously it's easy, but um, it, there, also the ceiling and everything needed to be checked and the walls needed to be checked because there, there's stone, but there's also just great cavities and we just needed a professional to, to do that. So that's why the builders are coming. I'm always trying to convince Guido to, uh, you know, do the work ourselves uh, because that's that's my philosophy. But I understand that also with this house in particular, often it does pay off to get a, a professional to look over it. it. It also depends on what type of house you're dealing with. I mean, in Australia, a lot of the houses are largely made out of timber and that's so much easier. You can easily uh, tear down a wall, you can easily repair a wall, you can easily plaster a wall. When you're dealing with a house that's made of stone and also that was built sort of a century ago or something. Finding with like the kitchen, for example, there's always dust and bits of plaster falling down from the ceiling every day. They sealed off the doorways and with professional machines created a giant cloud of dust, so thick you couldn't see a meter ahead of you. With my allergies, I'm very glad that I wasn't doing this part. So this is what they've done after a full day thing, which uh, they had to do with uh, machines and everything was the uh, the sanding and I have an electric sander but they, they had other special sanders to just take everything off this whole uh, ceiling and all the walls 
and uh, the whole room, when I just look, looked in this whole room, well, you couldn't even see the whole, the air was just thick with dust. So you see, the question was whether we paint in between the beams or whether we paint over the beams all completely. A friend of ours who's uh, an interior designer, he said uh, to paint over them. Uh, but Guido and I were thinking that maybe, you know, it's a, it's a country style house and it would just be a shame. And then you you know, it takes so much once you've, once you've painted over them, it takes so much to, uh, to sand them back again and you have to remove everything, uh, all the furniture. So, uh, and we quite like the, 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 the timber. So um, we're not, I don't think we're going to paint over them, although there are a lot of lovely examples uh, put on screen, lovely examples of French homes and, and some Italian homes where they do paint over them and it looks lo nice and fresh. But I think that because we're going for light colored walls, perhaps we don't need it. it it's not weighed down too much by the, um, the, the dark wood. So we're going to uh, varnish all of these beams and then the the question was whether to use the same color that same sort of sand uh, creamy sand color that I used in the bathroom and whether to use it not only on the walls but also in between the beams there both Guido and I really liked the the color in the bathroom and we decided that it's uh, we just really like it as a as a nice sort of fairly neutral but classic but also cozy warm base for the the bedroom and then uh, and then we can add color in, in uh, curtains or other 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 pieces but we had to decide whether we paint the ceiling in the same color as the as the walls that is the same color as the bathroom and I do like the idea of when you enter a room I think it makes it feel quite um, safe and and cozy like you're being enveloped by one color I do I do like that that effect and and honestly when I looked at this example which I'll put on screen now I thought I really I don't like of the beige on the on the walls and the white on the on the ceiling uh, for me and also for Guido it just feels a bit disjointed or it just it sort of stops the flow and I know in some cases it looks really good and in fact um you know, our friend said, well, why don't you take the color that we're going to use for the batiscopa? Now, the batiscopa is, in a lot of Mediterranean homes, they paint a darker line around the base of the walls. Aside from giving it a decorative touch, batiscopa in Italian literally means for the broom to hit against, so you're not making the walls dirty when sweeping or mopping. We were thinking of this accent color, gray, green, which I see a lot in the south of France, I think it pairs quite well with that creamy color which you see in the with the sandstone um, buildings. I also saw it in an upholstered chair we have here in a guest room and uh, the tones repeated again in Guido's mother's painting, particularly the Passepartout. Then we have four timber doors which we could paint in this accent color or we could varnish them and leave them natural. Or we could paint a thin border around each doorway which is often done here. What do you think? Next week we're getting two testers of this lighter and darker sage grey to see which one works better. Meanwhile, last week my father built a wood shed to store the wood for the fireplace in the kitchen. Guido helped him finish off the roof and looking at them happily working away, it made me so grateful that my husband gets on well with my parents, which is not always a given. No, I suppose otherwise to do a roof, what you do get, I got you some gloves there. Wow. Hello. This is the definitive woodshed. <laughs> wow. Come on. 
My father went and collected the old tiles from the ruined pigsties further down the hill uh, so that from a distance the woodshed looks more harmonious with the rest of the property. Looks great. Going to be so beautiful. Ah, il timo lo metto così. Sì? Metto sei piante di timo o bastano tre? No, bastano tre. E le altre mettiamo da un'altra parte. Perché, sì, no? facciamo Se più. No, mettiamo più, più prezzemolo. Ah, ora faccio una, una fila di, di, di timo, una fila di origano sì. e poi avanza posto. Sì. E via via ci mettiamo. Poi metto il ciclamino e lo pianto lì. Ah, underneath there. Ok, perfetto. Dovrebbe, stando all'ombra dovrebbe farcela. Ok. Spero. Now for the birthday cheesecake. I wanted to prepare an extra big portion because we were going to have lots of friends eating the cake. I've never seen a double layer cheesecake before but I thought the extra height always makes desserts feel more special and celebratory. So I made double my normal recipe which you can find on my website. I began with biscuit or cookie crumbs which I just blended to a fine dust added some brown sugar and cinnamon and melted butter. I cooked the crust with some baking beads. You, you needn't do this, but I just really wanted that weight so that the, uh, the, the sides didn't collapse down. I then take my cream cheese, which has been sitting out so it's not cold, and mix it in with the sugar. At this stage, the first crust is golden. Take that out of the oven and I put in the second one. I add some lemon zest and lemon juice. Sift in some corn flour, some vanilla. I mix in the room temperature eggs one at a time. Hot potato, ready to drop, I got a hot potato, somebody stop me, it's a molto caldo, for the del forno, it's a hot potato, straight out of the pot. Grazie, grazie, grazie. Even holds a candle, my baby, you and me are gonna be a scan. And then add yogurt, which gives my cheesecake a lighter flavor. Mixing gently by hand means I'll get a lovely creamy texture. If you use a stand mixer, uh, often people uh, overmix their cheesecake batter. Potatoes. 
Normally I top this with fruit, but I wanted the tops to be quite smooth because in this case, they are going to be on display. Last time I showed the recipe, I wrapped the bottoms in aluminium foil, but actually for a couple of years, I've been just adding water to a baking tray on the bottom shelf of the oven, and that still gives me a tender, creamy cake with no cracks. So you don't have to put it in a water bath. Once slowly cooled down in the oven with the door ajar, I put the cakes covered into the fridge overnight. The next morning, I heated brown sugar and butter. And then add salt, vanilla and cream to make a decadent salted caramel sauce. I was going to make a praline with pecans, but they aren't so easy to find in Italy. It's more of an American nut. Hazelnuts are much more Italian and ubiquitous in our supermarkets here. Tante Guri Ate. Wow. Tante Guri. Are you sure this is not a wedding cake? Beautiful, <laughs> bellissima. How do you oh, feel wow. to be 41? Fine, thank you. Beautiful <laughs> day. <laughs> The lunch was being held at a friend's house an hour from us and I had to hold this on my lap while Guido was racing around the curving roads. How do people transport cakes like this? It was so hard to keep it steady. Or maybe it's just my Italian husband who drives like a Formula One driver. In any case, it was a remarkable surprise that we ended up getting to our destination with the two layers and all of the uh, salted caramel sauce not over the front of my dress. Thank you to my patrons. Thank you to you for watching this far to the end. Please uh, consider subscribing to my channel and I will see you next episode. Alla prossima.